Hey, howdy folks, it's Howie here, Howie Cat, and I've got another installment on Understanding Comics. Chapter 3, Blood in the Gutter. Looks like it's going to be from 60 to 94, so I don't know if we're going to read this whole chapter. We'll see how it goes. It's a fast one or a slow one or a good one or what. So, chapter 3, Blood in the Gutter. <laughs> When I was very young, I had a recurrent daydream that a whole world was just a show put on for my benefit. That unless I was present thing to see things, they just ceased to exist. Later in life, I found others who had similar daydreams as children, none of us ever really believed these theories, but we all had, but we had all been fascinated by the fact that they could not be disproved. Notice as he leaves, and you know, nothing is happening until he gets here, and nothing happened before. That idea, see. Even today, as I write and draw this panel, I have no guarantee that my that anything exists outside of what my five senses report to me. I've never been to Morocco, but I take it on faith that it, there is a Morocco. I've never seen the Earth from space firsthand, yet I trust that the Earth is round. I've never been in the house across the street, yet I assume it has an interior that isn't just some big movie set. In this panel, you can't even see my legs, yet you assume that they're there. He looks kind of down at them. Even though they're not. He has no legs. All of us perceive the world as a whole through the experience, experience of our senses. Yet our senses can only reveal a world that is fragmented and incomplete. Even the most widely traveled mind can only see so much of the world in the course of a life. Our perception of reality is an act of faith based on a mere on mere fragments. As infants, we're unable to commit that act of faith. If we can't see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, or touch it, it isn't there. Peekaboo, she's playing peekaboo, and see the baby, she's gone, baby. <clears throat> the game peekaboo plays on this idea. Gradually, we all learn that even though the sight of mommy comes and goes, mommy remains. This phenomenon of observing the parts, but perceiving the whole, has a name. It's called closure. In our daily lives, we often commit closure mentally, completing that which is incomplete based on past experience. Actually, you don't see Pepsi on any of those. We know they say Pepsi. Some forms of closure are deliberate interventions, are deliberate inventions of storytellers to produce suspense or to challenge audiences. You see a guy with a woman and there's a shadow, so there's something we know more to come. Others happen automatically, without much effort, part of business as usual. In recognizing and relating to other people, we all depend heavily on our learned ability of closure. An incomplete world in an incomplete world, we must depend on closure for our very survival. Closure can take many forms, some simple, some complex. Here it is. So all these say Clinton. That doesn't have an O or a U or, I mean, they all say closure, but do they? Sometimes the mere shape or outline is enough to trigger closure. 
It's Mickey Mouse. The mental process described in chapter two, whereby these lines become a face, could be considered closure. Every time we see a photograph reproduced in a newspaper or a magazine, we commit closure. Our eyes take in the fragmented black and white image of the halftone pattern, and our minds transform it into reality of the photograph. In electronic media, closure is constant, even overpowering. Film closure takes place continuously, 24 times per second, in fact, as our minds, aided by the persistence of vision, transformed by a series of still pictures into a story of continuous motion. A medium requiring even more closure is television, in which reality is just a single point of light racing across hundreds across the screen so fast that it's described my face hundreds of times before you can even swallow that corn chip. Between such automatic electronic closure and the simpler closure of everyday life, there lies a medium of communication and expression which uses closure like no other, a medium where the audience is a willing and conscious collaborator, and closure is the agent of change, time, and motion. As you can see, you see him with the hat on his head and there, and we can fill in all that space here of the hat lifting. Uh, media guru Tony Swartz describes this at length in his book, Media, the Second God. some closure now you die no no and then yeah as we see a we know something happened <laughs> see that space between the panels that's what comics aficionados have named the gutter yes it is called the gutter and despite its unceremonious title the gutter plays host to much of the magic and mystery that are at the very heart of comics here in the limbo of the gutter, human imagination takes two separate images and transforms them into a single idea. Nothing is seen between the two panels, but the experience tells you something must be there. Peekaboo. Peekaboo. Comics panels fracture both time and space. I'm sorry. Comics panels uh, fracture both time and space, offering a jagged staccato rhythm of unconnected moments. But closure allows us to connect these moments and mentally construct a continuous unified reality. If visual iconography is the vocabulary of comics, closure is its grammar. And since our definition of comics hinges on the arrangement of elements, then in very real sense, comics is closure. The closure of electronic media is continuous, largely involuntary, and virtually imperceptible. But closure in comics is far from continuous and anything but involuntary. The now you die, no, no, scream. Every act committed to paper by the comics artist is aided and abetted by a silent accomplice, an equal partner in crime known as the reader. I may have drawn an ax being raised by this ex in this example, but I'm not the one who let it drop or decided how hard the blow how hard the blow, or who screamed, or why. That, dear reader, was your special crime. All of you participated in the murder. All of you helped the axe and chose your spot. We don't know where this guy was. If this guy was hit, we don't know what happened between here. We made that up, is what he's saying. That's great about comics. To kill a man between panels is to condemn him 
to a thousand deaths. Participation is a powerful force in any medium. Filmmakers long ago realized the importance of allowing viewers to use their imaginations. But while film makes use of audiences' imaginations for occasional effects, comics must use it far more often. From the tossing of a baseball to the death of a planet, the reader's deliberate voluntary closure is comics' primary means of simulating time and motion. Closure in comics fosters an intimacy surpassed only by the written word, a silent secret contract between creator and audience. How the creator honors that contract is a matter of both art and craft. Now let's take a look at the craft. Most panel-to-panel -panel transitions in comics can be placed in one of several distinct categories. And the first category, which we'll call moment-to-moment, -moment, requires very little closure. Next are those transitions featuring a single subject in distinct action-to-action -action progressions. So this took... Okay, here we have the two different ones. This was the moment-to-moment very little happened between them. Eyes open, eyes closed. But this is the balls coming at him, and wham, he got it. And we see more of both. The next type takes us from subject to subject while staying within a scene or idea. Note the degree of reader involvement necessary to render these transitions meaningful. Now you die. What more could go wrong? Well, at least Jerry never called. Ring. So, <laughs> that's kind of a good story there, actually. Guy crossing the finish line. Click. And finally, deductive reasoning is often required in reading comics, such as the scene-to-scene -scene transitions, which transport us across significant distances of time and space. He can't outrun us forever. Ten years later. He's in Bombay, Paris, New York. No one could have survived that crash. <laughs> Meanwhile, and he's on a... So these are examples of much time appearing between or much distance. Um, very big transitions, but they all tell little short stories. And finally, we have some more. We have more. That's so exciting. A fifth type of transition, which we'll call aspect to aspect, bypasses time for the most part and sets a wandering eye on different aspects of place, idea, or mode. And of course, we have transition of a tree and Santa, the transition of sun, and you know, Swaller House. And and finally, there's non sequitur, which offers no logical relationship between panels whatsoever. Have a satellite and American Gothic. They're saying cheese, a tree, and fish. Nixon and abstract art. There's no transit, nothing. Made no, you know, non sequitur. This last category suggests an interesting question. Is it possible for any sequence of panels to be totally unrelated to each other? Personally, I don't think so. No matter how dissimilar one image may be to another, there is a kind of fork, alchemy at work in the space between the panels, which can help us define meaning or resonance even in the most jarring of combinations. Such transitions may not make sense in any way, in any traditional way, but still a relationship of some sort will inevitably develop. Guns going off. Bang! 
By creating a sequence with two or more images, we are endowing them with a single overriding identity and we are forcing the viewer to consider them as a whole. However different they had been, they now belong to a single organism. Nancy and danger, you know. Closure for blood, closure for blood, gutters for veins. Weird images here. Not really, it's just showing now. This sort of categorization is an inexact science. At best, but by using your transition scale as a tool, we can begin to unravel some of the mysteries surrounding the invisible art of comic storytelling. Most mainstream comics in America employ storytelling techniques uh, first introduced by Jack Kirby. So let's start by examining this Lee Kirby comic from 1966. Altogether, I count 95 panel-to-panel transitions. Let's see how they break down proportionately. By far, far the most common type of transition in Kirby's action to action, I count 62 of them in this story, about 65% of the total number, traced and simplified for clarity, subject to subject, um, oh, action to action transition. That's the most common. Subject to subject transitions account for an additional 19, about 20% of the total number. We go subject to subject. And since all of the remaining transitions are from scene to scene, we have the following breakdown. As a bar graph, it would look something like this. An emphasis on this action-to-action storytelling suits most people's ideas about Kirby, but is he unique in this respect? Apparently not. It's a graph of panel transitions in Air J's Tintin, and the proportions are very similar to Kirby's. Now, Air J's and Kirby's styles are not similar. In fact, they are radically different. We see Air J's and Kirby... And this is some kind of, is this some kind of universal proportion at work here, or is there another common link? Maybe a similarity of genres? A random sampling of various American comics shows the same proportion pretty consistently. And we look at Claremont and Lee, X-Men number one, and Heartbreak Soup by Hernandez, uh, Betty and Veronica, Naughty Bits, uh, I don't know that part. Uh, Frank and the River, Contract with God, that's Eisner. Mouse, which I want to read here some days. And Donald Duck, even, by Carl Barks. All of them went with the same sort of transitions. A survey of well-known European artists yields similar, if not quite as uniform, results. What can we deduce from this? There are three types of transitions... All anyone should ever need to tell us... Oh, I'm sorry. Are these three types of transitions all anyone should ever need to tell a story in comics? If we choose to see stories as connected series of events, then the predominance of types two to four are easily explained. Types two to four show things happening in concise, efficient ways. Type 1 shows actions, like type 2, but it tends to require several panels to do what type 2 does in 2. See, type 1 is actions and 2 is scene to scene, if I remember correctly. Well, in the fifth type, by defining, by definition, nothing happens at all. And, of course, non sequiturs are unconcerned with events or, or any narratives, narrative purposes of any sort. Some experimental comics, like those of Art Spiegelman's early period, explore a full range of transitions. 
though generally in the service of equal radical stories and subjects. But before we conclude that type 2 and 4 have a monopoly on straightforward storytelling, let's take another look at the Asamanu Tezaka from Japan. Tezaka is a far cry from early Spiegelman. His storytelling is clear and straightforward. But look how he charts. Just what is going on here? There's the panels. That is much like the stuff I've been reading lately. Action to action transitions still dominate in Tezuka's work, but to a lesser degree. In fact, subject to subject transitions account for nearly as many actions. Here also we see our first examples of moment-to-moment -moment transitions. Though the latter type only accounts for 4% of the total, such sequences contrast strikingly with the Western traditions exemplified by Kirby and Erge. But most striking of all is the substantial presence of the fifth type of transition, a type rarely seen in the West. Aspect to aspect. Transitions have been an integral part of Japanese mainstream comics almost from the very beginning. Aspect to aspect it means a close up, another close up of here, and then you, we see where we're looking at different aspects of the same thing. Most often used to establish a mood, more sense of place, time seems to stand still in these quiet, contemplative combinations. Even sequence, while still an issue, seems far less important here than in other transitions. Rather than acting as a bridge between separate moments, the reader here must assemble a single moment using scattered fragments. Got someone sitting in front of the mash movie poster waking up we have to assemble that ourselves making up the story okay, so we are. Oh. <clears throat> in examining several Japanese artists we find similar proportions to Tezaka's including a high incident of the fifth type why length may be one of these factors. At work here, most Japanese comics first appear in enormous anthology titles, where the pressure isn't as great on any one installment to show a lot happening. When individual features are collected, they may run for thousands of pages, such as dozens of panels, as such dozens of panels can be devoted to portraying slow cinematic movements or setting a mood. I don't think longer stories are the only factor or even the most important one. I believe there's something a bit more fundamental to this particular East-West split. And here we see this is now we have Erje who did Tintin, who would be Western. He's a European artist, Kirby, American artist, and Tezuka, who did Astro Boy, and we see this slight, very different graph. And he's apparently walking through a garden, a Japanese garden. Hmm, where was I? Oh, yes, traditional Western art and literature don't wander much on the whole. We're all pretty goal-oriented culture. But in the East, there's a rich tradition of cynical and labyrinth works of art. Japanese comics may be heirs to this tradition in the way they so often emphasize being there over getting there. Through these other storytelling techniques, the Japanese offers a vision of comics very different from our own. For in Japan, more than anywhere else, comics is an art of intervals. The idea that elements omitted 
from a work of art are as much a part of that work as those included has been a specialty of the East for centuries. In the graphics arts, this has meant a greater focus on figural and figure ground relationships and negative space. This is the great wave of Kawaga. Uh, turn this picture upside down to see the other wave of negative space. And here's the other wave. You can kind of see it. It is a, a yin-yang, actually, that wave. In music, too, while the Western classical tradition was emphasizing the continuous connected works, worlds of melody and harmony, Eastern classical music was equally concerned with the role of silence. The last century or two... As Western culture influences swept the East, so too have Eastern and African ideas of fragmentation swept the West. From Debussy to Stravinsky to Count Basie, Western music has gradually incorporated a strong awareness of the power of fragmentation and intervals. <laughs> the music goes just... Dink and blah, clop, 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 you know. In the visual arts, the impact of Eastern ideas was both powerful and lasting. The traditional emphasis in Western art upon the primary foreground subjects and continuous of tones gave way to fragmentation and a new awareness of the picture plane. What do you think this painting is by Al Held is called? Answer is the big N. Oh my God, just a tiny. It is a big N. If you look close at this, I don't know if you can focus. A little tiny triangle here, a little tiny triangle here. It's called the big N. <clears throat> In theater, the idea that less is more has real practical implications. One of the most successful shows in history is The Fantastics a play whose entire set came in three pieces, a tattered banner, a stick, and a cardboard moon. The master of any medium using minimal elements has long been considered a noble aspiration. Here's a story. Promise me you won't drink and drive, Carl. As I promise. Well, it's getting late. This is watch. I better go now. Hmm. Seems I've lost my keys. Can I borrow yours? Okay, they're in my purse. Get the keys. Thanks. Get some car slam. Vroom. Vroom. Darn. Traffic slowdown. Hmm. I'll take a shortcut. Here I am. I hear... <laughs> it's really weird. I hear Daisy is ready. Ding dong. Hi, Carl. Hi, Daisy. I'm sorry, Carl. But I can't go out with you tonight. Aw. Uh, how about tomorrow night? Okay. Kisses her. Tomorrow it is. What'll I do now? I know. I'll rent a video. This is a video house. Hmm. I always wanted to see this one. 350, please. Here you go. Say, do you know Bill's last name? Bill who? That's what I'm asking you. I don't know any Bills. Okay. Have a nice day. I'll buy some beers. Stop and go. I'm out with the beers. One beer won't hurt. Glove, glove, glove. Crush. Rest in peace, Carl. End. Okay. That is a story. That is a story told too long, obviously, and that's what I think we're going to be told. And here's a story. Promise me you won't drink and drive, Carl. I promise. Vroom. Here I am. Hi, Carl. Hi, Daisy. I'm sorry, Carl, but I can't go out with you tonight. Nah, uh, what'll I do now? I'll buy some beers. Glug, glug, crash, rest in peace, Carl. There's a story. Promise me you won't drink and drive, Carl. I promise. Glug, glug, crash, rest in peace, Carl. The art of comics is as subtractive an art as it is additive. Promise me you won't drink and drive, Carl. I promise. Rest in peace, Carl. 
then we know the story no matter what. You don't need that many panels, or you can. And finding the balance between too much and too little is crucial to comics creators the world over. To strike that balance, creators regularly make a assumptions about their readers experience about their readers experiences some seem pretty safe like the assumption that this will be perceived by audiences as an eye closing and he backwards he mirrors it but which is meaningful we assume as readers that we will know what order to read the panels in but the business of arranging those panels is actually quite complex. So complex, in fact, that even seasoned pros will sometimes blow it. And I have blown it reading stuff to you. So you see, you would normally go left to right, going down. And you go down on the left, over, over, over. But this could be that there. See, this is not a well... I would normally go this, 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 but... It is not a well-arranged page. As closure between panels becomes more intense, reader interpretation becomes far more elastic. And managing it becomes more complicated for the creator. Some artists can be deliberately ambiguous, of course, and offer us no strict interpretation to go on. Closure can be a powerful force within panels as well as between them, which artists choose to show only a small piece of the picture. Comics can, mattingly, can be maddeningly vague about what it shows us by showing little or nothing of a given scene and offering clues, only clues to the reader. The artist can trigger any number of images in the reader's imagination as he's fading away. Readers faced with panels like these will have substantially different interpretations. Clackety clack clack. By constructing whole images based on these fragments, readers are performing closure just as whoosh, slips it. Huh? Uh, just as readers become an action or idea between I say, just as readers complete an action or... Ow, ow, stop that! Ding, ding. Ow. Ding, ding. Ow. So, something happening. We just can't see it. We don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. That's the idea. Is that we're not knowing what's going on, but we're making up a story there in our heads. Whatever the mysteries within each panel... It's the power of closure between panels that I find the most interesting. There's something strange and wonderful that happens in this blank ribbon of paper. We already know that comics ask the mind to work in sort of an in-betweener, filling in the gaps between panels as an animator might. But I believe there's still more to it than that. Let's take another look at the fifth type of transition, the one so popular in Japan. Here, a fourth panel establishing shot of an old-fashioned kitchen scene. So we see the aspect ratio, boiling pot, chopping, lady there, clock, tick, tick, tick. Now, most of you should have no trouble perceiving that you're in a kitchen from those four panels alone. With a, high with a high degree of closure, your mind is taking four picture fragments and constructing an entire scene out of those fragments. But the scene your mind constructs from those four panels is a very different place from the scene constructed from our traditional one panel establishing shot. Look again. You've been in a kitchen before. You know what a pot on the boil sounds like. Do you not only hear it in that first panel? And what about the chopping sound? Does that only last a panel or does it persist 
Or can you smell this kitchen? Feel it. Taste it. Comics is a monosensory medium. It relies only on one of the senses to convey a world of experience. But what of the other four? We represent sound through devices such as word balloons. But in all, it's an exclusively visual representation. Within these panels, we can only convey information visually. But between panels, none of our senses are required at all, which is why all of our senses are engaged. And let's just take a quick peek at that. Can you hear it, Boyle? Can you smell what's being cut? You know, do you hear the clock? That's the idea. And you do. I do. It's called good storytelling. Several times on every page, the reader is released like a trapeze artist into the open, into the open air of imagination, then caught by the outstretched arms of the ever-present next panel. Caught quickly so as not to let the reader fall into confusion or boredom. But it is possible that closure can be so managed in some cases that the reader might learn to fly. In chapter two, we discussed various types of iconic and non-iconic drawing styles. Do these affect closure? I think the answer is yes. Since cartoons already exist as concepts for the reader, they tend to flow easily between, <laughs> between panels. Ideas flow into one another seamlessly. We have someone here who wants to read with me. You can come in the panel if you want. But realistic images... You see, it's, oh, it's an Archie shadow. But realistic images have bumpier ride. There is a primary visual existence which doesn't pass easily into the realm of ideas. And what seemed like a continuous series of moments in the last example here looks a little more like a series of still pictures. There he is. To me, anyway... These things are all object of subjective. Similarly, I think when comics art veers closer to concerns of the picture plane, closure can be more difficult to achieve, though for different reasons. Now it's the unifying properties of a design that make us more aware of the page as a whole rather than its individual components, the panels. A good rule of thumb is that if readers are particularly aware of the art in a given story, closure is probably not happening without some effort. Of course, making the reader work a little may be just what the artist is trying to do. Once again, it's all a matter of personal taste. I see an eye. Open, close, open, close. The comics creator asks us to join in a silent dance of the seen and unseen, the visible and invisible. This dance is unique to comics. No other art firm gives so much to its audience while asking so much from them as well. This is why I think it's a mistake to see comics as a mere hybrid of the graphic arts and prose fiction. What happens between these panels it's a kind of magic only comics can create. <coughs> Excuse me. Here in the studio, I've tried to control that process and use it to make my case. But I can only point the way. I can't take you anywhere you don't want to go. All I can do is make assumptions about you and hope they're correct. Just as we all assume every day that there's more to life than meets the eye. All, all I ask of you is a little faith and a world of imagination. Another cat being a bother. He's a, such a good boy. Now we're on to chapter four, which is a perfect timing because we have this happening here. 
Anyways, thanks folks. Um, chapter four is time frames. We'll learn more about, I hope you learned a little bit about what happens and how you fill in the story when you read a comic and why and what the art firm form kind of uh, involves. Uh, if you haven't read comics, if you're a comic reader, that's a lot there that is really fascinating. If you're not a comic reader, perhaps you've learned something. We'll be doing chapter four in a week or so. Thank you again. This was Howie and a cat. <laughs>